Hello and a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on this week's show, a farewell to Iran's revolutionary father. Crowds and the political elite gather at the funeral procession of the country's former president, Ayatollah Ali Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani. The latest casualty in Syria's bloody conflict, drinking water. The two sides blame each other for the cutoff. Plus, we meet Palestine's answer to Frank Sinatra. Me to the moon, and let me play up there with those stars. Let me see what life is like on uh, Jupiter and Mars. We begin with the biggest funeral procession in Iran since the death of Ayatollah Khomeini back in 1989. Some 2.5 million are reported to have flocked to the streets of Tehran on Tuesday to say farewell to the founding father of the country's Islamic revolution, Ayatollah Ali Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani. Here's a look at the legacy of a man who in life divided Iran's political elite, but in death has brought them together. For decades, Ali Akbar Hashimi Rafsanjani was at the center of Iranian political life, before and after serving as president in the 1990s. He was a founding member of Iran's 1979 Islamic Revolution, a relative moderate in the turbulent years following the overthrow of the US-backed Shah. While Iran's war with Iraq in the 1980s took its toll, his was among the voices calling on the leadership to sign the peace deal to spare the economy from ruin. In the ensuing years, he also pressed for a more pragmatic foreign policy, particularly during his time as president from 1989 to 1997. He would never close the doors of the country to foreign countries, and when Iran was under international restrictions, he made efforts to promote interaction with the world. Rafsanjani allowed some freedoms during his term, for example in Iran's film and media industry. And he concentrated on economic reconstruction, supporting new development projects from shopping malls to high rises. However, corruption allegations cost him his later bid for the presidency in 2005, when he lost to Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Rafsanjani was criticized when he supported the opposition Green Movement in 2009, and he was blocked from the 2013 ballot by Iran's hardliners. Still, he continued to wield some influence as an advisor to reformist politicians. And until his death, he was the head of Iran's Expediency Council, an influential body that mediates between the parliament and the Guardian Council. With his bravery and bright thinking, he showed the right path to the youth. Hashemi Rafsanjani had several wishes for the honor of this country for the glory of the ruling system and for the revolution. Rafsanjani's death will deal a blow to the centrist president Hassan Rouhani, who's hoping to secure a second term in the face of resistance from hardliners. Next to Syria, where water has become the latest bone of contention. The regime and rebels have traded accusations over responsibility. This while the UN has warned the crisis facing some 5.5 million people in the war-torn country may constitute a war crime. Luke Schrego has the details. Taps in Damascus have been dry for weeks. The only way to get water now is by bringing buckets to certain points, some of which only operate for two hours a day. <laughs> Such shortages are no accident. Water has become a strategic target in Syria's long-running civil war. The capital gets its supply from Wadi Barada, about 15 kilometers to the west. However, it's in rebel hands, and fighting has raged there for about three weeks, with Syrian forces accusing the armed opposition of contaminating the water flowing to Damascus with diesel fuel. Rebels, however, are pointing their own fingers. This is the Ain al fije water facility, which the regime forces claim the rebels have blown up. Everyone knows how much concrete there is in the facility's foundation. What else could blow it up except their missiles and their hated barrel bombs? The United Nations, for its part, says the infrastructure was deliberately targeted, leaving some five and a half million without access to water. It's been clear about the view it takes. 
to sabotage and deny water is, of course, a war crime because it is civilians uh, who drink it and civilians who will be affected by waterborne diseases and other uh, if it's not uh, uh, restored. The potential for the spread of disease is yet another spectre that's reared its head, one likely to worsen civilian suffering amid ongoing fighting, despite a ceasefire technically being in place since the end of last year. Now it's time to take a look at the stories that have been making waves online and in the media across the Middle East. Joining me in the studio is Mariam Saab. It's good to be here. And Mariam, it's not a great start to 2017 for Benjamin Netanyahu. He is mired in a series of corruption scandals. Last week, the Israeli Prime Minister was interrogated not once but twice by police under caution, marking the beginning of an official criminal investigation into his alleged misconduct with businessmen. And now he's embroiled in yet another scandal. As this week's uh, Newsweek headline shouts, Netanyahu caught on tape arranging quid pro quo with newspaper owners. The paper is, uh, of course, one of Israel's largest selling dailies. It's called Yediet Achachronot, and the other voice on the tape reportedly belongs to uh, Netanyahu critic Noni Moses. Channel 2 TV reported that the right wing leader offered to limit the circulation of the paper's rival, uh, Israel Hayanem, which is a free daily published by US billionaire and Netanyahu political patron Sheldon Adelson in exchange for friendly coverage from Yehiet Ahachronot. Now, uh, Marco have mocked up a cover for Yehiet Ahachronot, showing Netanyahu on the way to be questioned when his attention and ours, as you can see, is drawn to a cute furry little kitten. A very telling diversion there. Now, Haretz asked the question, will secret negotiations with Adelson's media rival force him to resign Netanyahu, that is? Well, by Israeli law, he only has to step down if if the conviction uh, is upheld by an Israeli high court on appeal. And Mariam, a series of family photos seem to have gone completely viral in Egypt. They are of the engagement ceremony of a seven-year-old boy to a four-year-old girl. Can you talk us through them? These pictures were posted on Facebook and Twitter. We have seven-year-old Zayn placing a wedding ring on the finger of his four-year-old cousin, Farida. In this shot, uh, in the next shot we're about to see, they're cutting the engagement cake. Uh, now, of course, engagements are usually cause for celebration, but this one has sparked some outrage. It was picked up by the mainstream press. The headline of Al Arabiya reflects the general tone across the region outrage as photos emerge of Egyptian children engaged to be married. It also raises the wider ongoing problem of child marriages in Egypt. Uh, the legal age of marriage is 18, but many families circumvent that by uh, officially registering underage marriage once the couple has in fact turned 18 and 17 percent of girls marry before they're 18. According to an article on Vocative News, the ceremony took place in a village in Cairo. Uh, the father told local media that he paid a dowry to the girl's family of around 950 euros. The story has been shared more than 10,000 times on social media platforms. I'm going to take you through some of those reactions. They're not too kind. Uh, we've got one uh, saying, uh, I want to know where are the human rights associations in all this? This is a violation of their childhood. The parents must be punished and imprisoned. And then another reaction. At first, it made me laugh. I thought it was their birthday. Now I want to cry. Mariam Saab, thank you very much for talking us through what's trending in the region. Thank you. Now, he's young. He's a certified heartthrob, and he sounds just like one of the most iconic crooners of our times, Frank Sinatra. He is Omar Kamal, a Palestinian who's secured a record label with Sony. His new album is out this week in Dubai, and he joined our France 24 team in Ramallah to sing in French as well as in English. Kamal's been in love with the old songs and the old jazz crooners since he was a teenager. If it takes forever, I will wait for you. And yes, it's old blue eyes, Frank Sinatra himself, who most inspired Omar 
when he was listening to music and dreaming at his home in the West Bank town of Nablus. Sinatra has got this really um, profound ability to, to deliver and to um, and kind of tell a story to, uh, to the audience and, 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 and get everyone uh, in the audience kind of, you know, in the same uh, feeling. Yeah, Ramallah is, is pretty nice. It's, it's chilled out and, uh, and it's, you know, it's the closest thing to, a, to an international zone. <laughs> Omar studied in the UK to be an engineer like his dad. But over there, he was also the lead vocalist in a jazz band. Doing all of these uh, things in, in music, I, I gained that confidence to come back here and, and maybe form my own band and put together a show. And, and after that, eventually, uh, Sony Music Middle East uh, in Dubai got in touch and, uh, and, and then the conversation uh, started from there. It's like a fairy tale. Yeah. Well, almost like a fairy tale. Fly me to the moon and let me play up there For with his those debut stars. album, Sony's brought international music legends on board to produce and mix it. They shot in Rome and recorded in Hollywood. They clearly believe Omar Kamal has star quality. I love Well, that's it for this edition of Middle East Matters. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Do stay tuned to France 24.